And then Brian, were you around during that era? When, when did you start following the band? Uh, so yeah, I grew up in Pennsylvania. So for much of the eighties, I was just, I was hearing the SST stuff. And then I didn't finally see them till, till this era. We would just come to New York and go see bands. And I saw the Ritz show, which was, I guess, kind of at the tail end of the Daydream tour proper, but it was, uh, yeah, it was the first time I saw them and Mud Honey opened and the Laughing Hyenas opened and we got there kind of late, but Old Skull opened. We were like seven and nine year old kids. It was totally insane. But, uh, you know, that night Sonic Youth were so great. And I remember like there was all these tapes between the songs, like while, while guitars were being changed and there was like Edie Brickell and Guns N' Roses. And I don't think you guys, I think you guys knew you were gonna be on Geffen yet, right? Was that <laughs> kind of coincidence? <laughs> um, we had had meetings at Geffen, and I think we, that was our loot that we had taken home. Was yeah. that, that was the Edie Brickell tape, so. Okay. <laughs> they bribed you with Edie Brickell tapes. And stuff. <laughs> wow, that's yeah, that show was so awesome. You were playing old stuff and Daydream stuff, and it like totally was mind-blowing. It was a very unusual set. It's a show that people keep bringing up. And um, like Aaron mentioned earlier, we're working on this archive thing. It's it's one of the shows that we we've, we've been listening to and thinking about putting up on this archive. But oh, yeah. but um, I don't know I don't know why it always sticks in in your memory. This this because you've seen lots of Sonic Youth shows. Yeah so, yeah. So I think that one was just such a cross section of stuff that I it's like you know it's very interesting to me. I guess. Yeah. And this old venue in, in New York, the the Ritz, which was a which was was a great place. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I also like one of I mean, my I guess you know the critical hype around Daydream Nation or whatever. I think my first awareness of that was like reading all like British newspapers. I was reading Sounds and Mel and was getting like a ten in every issue and stuff. And it was kind of interesting to see that this whole film was you know like kind of British sponsored and you were on a British label then. And what Thurston was saying about it, you kind of like blowing a hole through you know, the non-guitar aesthetic. Do you think that was true? Do you think that was like one reason like Britain got really behind this album and really kind of put it through a uh, stratosphere in a way, kind of? I, I think it was something we were concerned with that the guitar wasn't dead and it wasn't over with, you know, because we, we had seen so many great bands in, in the States and guitar-driven bands, you know, like Mud Honey or the Butt Bowl Surfers mm -hmm. or Laughing Hyenas and, um, you know, and before that, the birthday party from Australia with Roland S. Howard. So we didn't think the guitar was over by any means. So, so we did often joke about some bazaar and and Steve-O who ran who ran it that, that, that they had sort of you know made made a statement that it's it's now the time of the keyboard or the synth or whatever. And, yeah. You know that stuff just goes around, obviously. But wasn't Mute interested too in the band around that time or something? Mute, yeah. Well, we were kind. Of, I always felt we were kind of on mute because Blast Burst was like a okay. subsidiary of, of Mute. Right. So when we would go to the Blast Burst offices, it, it was in Mute Records. Okay. You know, you'd go in there and um, um, Depeche Mode would be having a meeting or whatever. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Never Nick Cave. I guess he didn't. He didn't have meetings. Yeah. <laughs> Um, when you've been going back and listening to shows from that era, Aaron, I think that today the announcement was made that a lot of the archival stuff you guys have been listening to is available for people to listen <coughs> through that website and others. Right. Um, were there shows that stood out from this era or things that, that you're particularly interested in? Well, you know, Steve and I worked together on the Daydreamation Deluxe version that came out however long ago. And um, and we had kind of already sorted through all of the 88, 89 tapes <clears throat> in that case. And I mean, we actually listened through all of the best tapes. And for that, we put the best version of each song on there. So we kind of already knew this time period pretty well and what was out there. <laughs> so um, the, the CB's show, which was the at, kind of after the tour, then they got back to New York and there was a benefit for See Here, which was a zine store that had been flooded. Um, and so that was like two days after the end of the tour proper. Um, and we, we knew about that tape and used some of it on the Daydream Deluxe. And there's a couple radio ones and stuff. But uh, 
the CDs was one of the only ones that was multi-track, so that was yeah and, and been properly yeah because there was a two-inch machine at CDs and then uh, and Kramer from Gumball or Ball had was it Ball or Gumball at that time? I don't he was know. Yeah, I don't he's don't remember which one. Kramer he recorded it in Warden Tears that mixed it years ago and the tapes just sat there for twenty eight years or something. You know? We have a lot of stuff like that and. Yeah. That's why Aaron and I have been working on some of these things lately, so it doesn't just sit in a room somewhere that we can um, have some fun with it. Are there any live Chaconi shows that they ever do, do anything in, kind of like a weird context, the Chaconi Youth, uh, Chaconi Youth Live? Not that I can think of. Um, um, did you ever see From Here to Infinity? It was a tape project that Lee had, that um, um, Lee and myself would um, would use really early uh, cassette sampling. Oh, that's the Lock Groove record, right? Yeah, yeah. the Lock Groove record. And, and there's a few shows of that, and, and Aaron and I were talking about, we have to listen to this and see what, what oh, it sounds cool. like, you know, uh, many years later. But but Ciccone, I don't think so. That was just, um, that was to get out of uh, the, the sort of the normal cycle that we were in. We were in a tour record, tour record cycle. And so um, we just wanted to get into a studio and just kind of start throwing ideas on the tape w without too much thought, without too much uh, work on the writing process. So that was all like kind of immediate music, jams, improv, and um, that's how that came about. Was that concurrent with making Daydream or was that at a different Time. It was the same year, though, right? Exactly. We we made it. Um, we came home from the sister tours, and uh, and made Chicone Youth with Wharton Tears in New York, and then we went and uh, wrote all the Daydream stuff and recorded it. So we had a longer break from going out on tour. Mm -hmm. Then when we did go on tour with Daydream, it was it was our longest uh, period of touring in, uh, ever because uh, we start going to new new territories like like Japan. Australia, New Zealand, and at the very end, we went to, to the Soviet Union. The track Providence, uh, which is sort of like midway through the record, all right. Um, <laughs> if you could talk about what people are hearing during, during that track, and then I was curious if the band had, during that era, made any other recordings like that that didn't make it to the record, but were music concrete, sort of. Yeah, um, we didn't record a lot that didn't make it onto the record, so, um, there weren't many outtakes in, in those days, and um, I guess the couple deluxe editions that we did, we, we found the live best stuff, yeah. The, the, yeah, there was and some live stuff. Like covers and beat. Yeah, stuff. yeah, there, there wasn't a lot of studio outtakes, but that particular recording, I think we were having a lunch break or a dinner break, and um, Thurston loves these uh, old PV amp heads, and um, they have a fan on top of, top of the head to, uh, to keep it cool. Because it's too vamp, it gets it gets quite warm, and I think someone had put like a jacket or a magazine on the fan, and um, these uh, PVs over, over overheat pretty easily, and so we were in uh, the control room, and I guess there must have been a mic on, and we were just hearing this ungodly sound from the other room, and of course, being it was Sonic Youth, someone said record that, <laughs> and so. So that's recorded, and then Thurston uh, later layered this uh, um, piano part that he had um, recorded at, at his parents' home, at his mother's home in Connecticut. And, um, and then the strangest part of it is, is Mike Watt um, leaving phone messages on Kim and Thurston's phone machine um, after they had, uh, uh, Thurston and, and I guess Firehose at the time had had a, music store shopping spree where, you know, get, getting cables and strings and things. And Thurston got home and, um, and Mike, Mike had driven off to Providence for their next show and Thurston got home and, and he didn't have any of the cables. And, and so he's leaving messages for Mike, do you have the cables? And Mike is, that's, that's why we hear Mike uh, saying, did you find the shit? You know, you gotta watch the Mota. So, you know, it's just that's Mike and, and his San, San, San Pedro, San Pedro talk. You, know. you mentioned um, Kim and Thurston. We see some footage in the Blood and the Music that we just saw with Bob Burt, who was drumming prior to when you mm -hmm. joined the band. Can you tell the audience about like the dynamic of like how you got asked to join Sonic? Oh yeah. Well, um, 
Bob Hoop was the drummer before I joined, and um, the record that they made before I joined was called Bad Moon Rising, and they were on tour in, um, in England, opening for Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, and um, I had, had wound up uh, in New York uh, house-sitting and dog-sitting for, for Kim and Thurston. So um, this tour kept on getting extended, and uh, they would call um, home and say, hey, can you guys stay? Because it was a couple, uh, couple guys from Michigan. We were, we were staying in the apartment. Like, can you stay another week? And we were like having the time of our lives, you know, in New York, living in New York for the first time. So, um, so that's how, um, so how I wound up there. They came, uh, I guess at some point, Bob had decided to leave the band and they came home. I was kind of there with a drum kid in the, in the hallway, and they, and they invited me to, to be in the band. All right. <laughs> I said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you have any uh, memories of what the Bay Area was like for the band over the years? Oh, it's, it's great. It's great to come through here. Yeah, always good. Um, you know, always great to go, you know, we, we love to go record shopping. And um, yeah, just there was always, a, you know, someone good to play with you know, have open for you or, or, or do shows with. So, um, oh, we, we had years, years of fun shows here. There was a show in 1999, probably in the summer, uh, either late <laughs> June or July, uh, at the Greek. Uh -huh. yeah. And I think that was the last show that ever happened with all of your original gear. Well, with the gear that we were touring with at the time, yeah. We, we played with Sleater Kinney that night and, um, and you know, the, all the gear got put in a, in a truck and it was driven down to Orange County because we were playing, <laughs> playing a, a, a show, um, a, kind of a festival called This Ain't No Picnic, uh, oddly enough. And, um, and the night before the show, the, the truck was stolen with, with all the gear. And, and oddly, Lance uh, recorded the night with all the gear, the old gear, and then you recorded the night that we played with all this borrowed gear, because that's the only way we could play that day, was um, using Sleater Kinney's gear and uh, um, Mike Watts' gear and, and Boredom. Oh, it's a great, and a great, a great bill at this uh, at this mini festival we had. Um, do either of you know if there is like audio multi tracks of any of that those shows? Oh, those two nights. Or... I could look on my phone. But that would be weird. <laughs> I have the database, but it seems awkward. Um, are there any? Uh, we'll find it. Any memories that, that you have, Brian? Of like, uh, Brian was on the East Coast for a good number of years before moving out here to the Bay Area, and was involved at WFMU, a, a wonderful radio station there. Woo! Yeah, so, I think my favorite story was I think I mean, made it up to Binghamton to college to see you guys. And uh, I think it was the first time like the boredoms came over to the states, so there was kind of a, kind of maybe a powwow of like trying to see what the boredoms were all about, and everybody was kind of eating dinner and, and uh, bouncing names off them like Nirvana, dinosaur, and the boredoms were like uh, we don't know any of that. And Thurston was like, well, what records have you bought? And they just opened up this box of Chipmunk records. They uh, they just spent their whole tour collecting Chipmunks albums. <laughs> I remember that they were showing a trailer for Chipmunk Punk before this, and I was like, that kind of stuck in my mind. First thing was just like flabbergasted. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no idea. <laughs> it's funny because I remember that story, but I remember that, that um, I had, had, he had pulled out um, Cheech and Chong records. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly an influence on them. It's pretty they never made it past the siege. <laughs> 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 But we also put on a show for uh, FMU's 50th anniversary, and Sonic Youth were like super generous, made shirts, and uh, it, was, it was down in Battery Park, and it was like, we, we broadcast it live, it was such an amazing day, it was like 2008, I think, and it came out as an LP, like a Matador uh, pre-sale LP, I think. Um, but that day, it was just another, like, outdoors, beautiful summer day, 4th of July. Um, I think like Thurston gave out Tom Sergal's address for everybody to go look at fireworks on his roof after the show. So I was cool. wondering if like a million people showed up at his house, but um, that was also just another great memory. And the Feelys opened, they were like back together after 15 or 20 years or something. So that was an amazing show. 
I have a fun memory of that day because I had this really screwed up Carfield shirt and short shorts on. <laughs> and Steve, Steve pointed me out to Tom Verlaine. I was like, that's her sound head over there. And according to Steve, his response was, is he even American? <laughs> so I, I felt like that was the best compliment I got. You're not American. <laughs> Steve, you, um, you did a tour not long after Daydream uh, for a sort of a this part of California resident Neil Young. Can yeah. you tell me things that you recall about like, getting asked to do that and what that meant to you as a fan of his music and what that experience of touring with him was like? That was a, that was a weird, weird tour. Um, um, we were really happy to go out and tour with Neil Young. He, um, at that time, didn't really take opening bands with them, so it was kind of a learning experience for, for everybody, in, including his road crew. And um, they weren't always happy to see us, and we were sort of uh, sometimes treated like uh, the, the annoying children of the tour. And, um, and uh, Neil's audience wasn't, as much as you think we should go hand in hand or whatever, his audience wasn't really ready for us either. So we would have nights where you would see people, you know, you're playing and you would see people like, standing like this. Yeah. And, um, and we would get booed uh, on occasion, which, which was a really awesome experience. And, and at first I didn't know what was happening, and you, you hear the sound, you know, is it feedback or what? And then, you know, and I said, oh, we're, we're, we're getting booed. This is fantastic. You know, it's like, I, I thought, we're still relevant, you know, we, we still matter. And, um, but um, the tour did get better as, as we went uh, towards the West Coast. And um, some of the shows out here were um, general admission, and that kind of brought a better spirit to, to the to the night because because um, most nights our, our our few fans would be like way way in, in the rafters, you know, and so it's hard to play when someone's over there, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, but um, he he played. Amazingly, on that, on that tour, and I, I must have seen him play 30 times, you know, of all those shows, and um, it really taught us how to play on bigger stages. Which um, soon after that, we did we did the Lollapalooza tour, which we at that point we felt like, okay, we can play on any any type of venue, and, and we play small clubs or or play um, one of those outdoor sheds. We felt like we could do it and and make a show. So that was something that we learned by you know, by being on this Neil Young tour opening for him. Right on. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions from anyone in the audience? Yep. 